John Karabi, what's going on, man? I know, uh, I know you're just probably wrapping up a bunch of acoustic shows right now, is what I'd imagine. Yeah, well, I have one more tomorrow. Uh, I played last night in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and I have one more tomorrow. We end the tour with Tom Kiefer and Winger at the Ryman Theater in Nashville, which is a bucket list place for me. Nice. All the guys, actually, none of us, none of us have played there. And it's just the world famous place that, you know, Elvis played at and Johnny Cash and, you know, all those famous country stars. So we're all looking forward to it. That's incredible. And of course, you know, this coming right after, of course, the anniversary of Elvis's passing. I mean, you know, I'm, I wonder, did that bring anything up for you yesterday? Um, you know, to be honest with you, I was so caught up in what I was doing with the show yesterday that I didn't even think of it. But that's uh, that I, 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 didn't, I didn't even think of it. That's crazy. Quite a coincidence, eh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's insane. I mean, I can't imagine the list of bucket list venues is very long for you at this point because you've done so many. Or are there others that maybe you, you hope to play one day? No, there's a few. There's I I, I have the um, obviously I've played the whiskey many many times. Yeah. The Roxy. Um, we're getting ready to play it again with the Dead Daisies this September 10th, I believe. Um. I played Budokan in Japan, so that that was great. Amazing. Um, God, let me think. What else is left? Well, obviously, the obvious, Madison Square Garden. Um, and then I would like to play the Spectrum in my hometown, Philadelphia. You know, that would be that would be great. But we'll see. Definitely going to see what happens. And, of course, back, you mentioned back with the Dead Daisies. You know, yes. it's fans are so happy about this man i mean the the outpour of support and you know has just been incredible maybe talk to us about what that's been like since coming back into the group yeah you know what i wasn't sure after having left the band and then glenn Hughes joining i mean glenn's such a legendary singer bass player obviously from deep purple um i kind of thought i was you know maybe it was wrong of wrong of me to assume but i just assumed there'd be more people not happy that i was coming back after hmm. after glenn but um i gotta be honest with you like the the response has been beyond overwhelming um so i'm happy about that i i guess to some degree people become accustomed to you know certain certain names certain singers certain band members or whatever and uh you know so i feel like i'm just going home you know what i mean yeah no that makes sense and i mean obviously you know no matter how many years you have in this and you have so many years and you're regarded as a legend by so many but you know guys like deep purple that must be interesting because you know like i say you're regarded as legendary but you know these guys are legends to you so you feel that that pressure when you come back yeah, it was weird. Like, I remember, you know, God, I'm going back to when I was a teenager. I remember seeing, um, they used to have this TV show on called uh, Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. Okay. And they did a special um, on the very first, what they called the Cal Jam, California mm. Jam. Right. In, in 74, and Deep Purple played. And I remember seeing Glenn Hughes for the first time in this white satin outfit, playing this bass and doing these unbelievably high banshee screams. And I was like, wow, who is this guy? You know, and then I had the good fortune when I was in Motley to meet him again. And he sang with me on the Motley record. Right, And then when I left the Daisies to have somebody replace me, I go, I couldn't be more honored than it to be Glenn Hughes. You know what I mean? Um, it's just, just awesome. I mean, if you have to be replaced in a band by somebody, why not Glenn Hughes? It's awesome. No question. So, I mean, like pressing that reset button, then is it a much different process mentally in the band this time around? Or is it like sort of tapping back into that mindset from before? 
Uh, no, I think it's a little bit different. Um, you know, one of the things when I did sit down with David Lowy, the founder of the band, um, we talked about me coming back. And and I, I think the one thing he made clear, I didn't even have to say anything. Um, he knew what my reasons were for leaving. And he just wanted to assure me that we were still going to go in and do records. We were still going to go out and, you know, for lack of a better term, kick ass on tour, do the best that we could. But we were going to do it in a manner where we weren't tapping into that burnout phase or that burnout situation that it wasn't just me. I think everybody in the band, we were all so tired um, the first go around that we said, look, let's work smarter, not harder. You know what I mean? Let's let's be smart about this. So now, you know, we're going to go out like this first run that we're doing. It starts uh, August 22nd and it runs through September 10th. And then we're going to take a little break and then we go to Japan and you are amazing. And then we take it. Yeah, we take another, you know, go out for a couple weeks, like three weeks, three and a half weeks, a month. Come home. Before we were like literally. You know, we'd go out in May and come home in, you know, September. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's insane. We, we've all kind of figured out how to do this, have fun, still kick ass, but do it in a manner where we're not killing ourselves in the process. Well, of course, right? And I mean that that must be an interesting place to reach because you guys have paid your dues when it comes to that years ago. So I mean it, it makes a lot more sense. What do you think kept you guys touring that hard for so long uh it was just you know it's weird the band really just kind of blew up and we were just getting constant offers to do this do that do this festival do this tour um so you know we were trying to take advantage of everything all of us um you know uh, and it was just, we were overlooking the fact, like David said, we kind of let it slip away. The idea, you know, if, if I can back up, David's initial thought process on this was to put a band together, do something he's always wanted to do and have fun. Yeah. Um, so he's like, the fun part was just kind of getting away from us. So, uh, they kind of figured it out. You know what I mean? They, they, uh, really kind of figured out, started seeing like scheduling things with Glenn. And then when Glenn left to do his deep purple shows again in uh, black country communion, what, when they called me up, they said, here's how we're going to do this. I, we, again, we want to work, we want to work hard, but not to the point of losing sight of having fun and burning out. Yeah, no, that, that completely makes sense. I mean, when you look back at your time in Motley, for example, did you guys experience that burnout in that group? Yeah, because again, it was for multiple reasons. Um, you know, I think we were on tour from God, I can't remember now, but <clears throat> we were on tour for like, five straight months they lived on tour right basically yes and but also at the same time it was a weird time in music so we weren't selling out a lot of venues so there was a lot of uh negativity going around hmm. which was also taxing and draining on everybody um you know sitting there pulling our hair out going wait you know the last time we were here we did two sold out shows in this ice hockey arena that holds 15,000 people. And now we're like selling out half of the half of the venue. Mm -hmm. And it was like, so there was a lot of negativity. We were tired. We were burnt. Um, everybody was panicked, thought it was the end of the careers. You know what I mean? Um, so that was uh, that was pretty brutal. 
Yeah. I mean, and that must have taken so much energy because I think a lot of bands of the same era experienced a similar stagnation at that time and then came back bigger than ever, you know, shortly after. So, I mean, yep. that must have been very tough. Yeah, it, it was. It, it was definitely a tough, dark uh, period of all of our lives, you know, but, um, you know, congratulations to Motley. They stuck it out and now they're right back doing, you know, football stadiums again. So, you know, that's the power of longevity and just <laughs> waiting till the circle, you know, yeah. the circle of, of life comes back around again and lets you back in the door. So it's, it's insane. I mean, does it surprise you sort of the reach that you're seeing today with, with Motley and, and maybe other bands of the era that it's, it's as big as it is today? No, I think, you know, because all of the copycat bands kind of fell along the wayside. They stopped. They mm -hmm. moved on. They did other things. Motley, Motley's been Motley since 1981. And, you know, like I said, they just, they went, they went out of, uh, they were out of fashion for a minute, you know, but they came back bigger, stronger, faster, and better than ever. So, um, more power to them. Bands like Def Leppard, uh, even uh, Joe Elliott has said it in an interview. He said, you know, the, the thing is with a lot of these type of bands, you just got to wait until you're fashionable again. Yeah. yeah. So and, and it's it's the case with anything. Who knew, you know, who knew that all the bell bottom jeans that I had in the 70s <laughs> It's a hot commodity. Or again, you know what I mean? Fashionable again 20 years later. So it is what it is. That's a great point. You know, thinking of uh, obviously, you know, Mick Mars, that's a guy who I think has always fascinated me. What can you, you know, speak on when it comes to collaborating with him in the creative process? Mick is awesome. I, yeah. You know, I, I you know, it, and screw the talent whatever obviously anybody that knows mick knows he's talented you know bottom line of it is to me mick is just a nice guy yeah he's he's a good dude um and anybody that's followed motley's career has known that mick's always been kind of the he's been in the back seat he's been the quiet one he hasn't been out there causing anybody any problems or trouble or you know he just kind of keeps to himself does his thing um but mick's done some stuff for me personally that i was just like just blown away by you know what i mean he's just a good dude and i just hope that at some point without going into detail i just hope that mick and motley can eventually resolve their differences and move on you know, Mick with his solo career, Motley with whatever they're going to do and just move on. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, we definitely hope for that and we wish him the best no matter what he does. I mean, I think a lot of people were really surprised about some of the statements when it came to the live playing. Um, that's something I wanted to ask you about. I mean, when we hear things like the majority of Nikki Six's bass playing is a track, I mean, is that something that's even possible in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, you know, nowadays recording uh, on Pro Tools, you know, if you said to me, like, because I, I released a couple songs, you know, a little bit ago, if you said to me, hey, can you just give me the, you know, rhythm guitar track, I could literally just go online highlight that track and email you just that track so as far as the drums go or any of that stuff nowadays with computers and all that shit yeah it's um it's possible is it happening i don't know i haven't toured with motley for 27 years 28 years um, was it happening while you were touring with them no, I mean, we did use tracks. I, I'll mm -hmm. say that right now. Like we used, but we we were using um, some backing vocal tracks. Okay. Um, and we used for the song Misunderstood, there was a 53-piece orchestra uh, on that track. 
So we just used the orchestra tracks to enhance what we were doing live on stage. Yeah. But but then uh, Nikki was playing bass. Tommy was playing drums. Mick was playing guitar. I was playing guitar and I was singing. Um, yeah. Now, whether or not they've elaborated since, I, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I haven't seen Motley live since uh, I saw them one time in my entire life. And that was a tour they did in like 2003 or four with they toured with Aerosmith. Right. OK. Uh, yeah. And I saw them that one time and I haven't seen them since. So yeah. I don't know about. Mick's claims Mick has never really been a bullshitter in the past so if he says they were using tracks then you know maybe they were I don't know do you care at all and that this goes beyond just Motley I'm just really curious in general if any band do you think that that is a negative thing or does it even matter you know <clears throat> that's not for me to determine you know, honestly, uh, you know, I'm sure it's out there, the bands that are using tr tracks to enhance their sound. Um, if the fans want to pay the money for a ticket, knowing that there's probably tracks being played, then that's that's their call. Personally, yeah. um, I don't really believe in it myself. Um, you know, I have a solo band, the Dead Daisies. We don't use any tracks at all. Um, are the backing vocals as strong as they are on on the record? No, but it's live. I remember right. as a kid seeing Aerosmith and and hearing, you know, four part harmonies on songs that Aerosmith did. And then I'd go see them live and it was just Stephen and Joe Perry singing. Yeah. Um, this kind of ratty little whatever. And I I always enjoyed it. It was about seeing the whole band and seeing the whole process and seeing the show. Mm -hmm. um, so personally, I I wouldn't do it, but that's that's just me. Other bands choose to do it and the fans are still buying tickets for them. Then great awesome knock yourself out i have no comment positive or negative on on the subject at all you know what i mean i i just to each his own that's why they have 32 flavors of baskin robbins that's it man i completely agree dude and, and i really respect that perspective as well um you know one question that we did actually get from a listener um was was there or are there any existing studio track recordings of you doing any songs on Generation Swine? And if so, how much of that album was actually done before the lineup actually changed? Um, well, I'm sure there are some tracks, but Tommy, Nikki, and, you know, the Motley guys would have those. Um, part of my deal when I left was that I had to take whatever uh studio tracks that i had whether they were on cassette or dat or whatever i had to kind of turn them in because they were it was property of of the band um so i don't i don't have anything but if um i'm sure motley does have some tracks and as far as how much of the record was done i'd say probably I don't know, 70, 80% of the record. Wow. Okay. That's definitely interesting. I'm, I'm sure they'll, people will be happy to hear about that. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your experience with Rat. Um, and let me know if I have this right. So you were offered the singing position in Rat and you declined it and accepted the guitarist position. Is that correct? Yes. So what was behind that exactly? I'm curious. Um. Well, what joining rat or, or well, the, saying no to the singing position? Cause the, you would assume that you would say yes, but I'm, I'm just curious. No, because you got to remember, I, I had done, I had, I had literally, I, I was in union 
the band Union. And I was at that point, maybe, I don't know, three years removed from doing Motley. Yeah. And I was like, again, whether you love him or hate him, Stephen Piercy's an iconic singer as well. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not interested in buying that T-shirt. I bought it with Motley. I wore it and I put it away. <laughs> so I'm done. You know what I mean? But um, uh, I was talking to um, Robbie Crane was the bass player at the time. And I had told him we were talking on the phone and I said, oh, yeah, I ran into Bobby Blotzer a couple of days ago. And he told me you guys were looking for a singer and asked me if I would do it. And uh, Robbie was like, oh, man, yeah, it'd be great. And I said, no, no, no. I told him no. And he goes, oh, whatever. And, and so we were talking and he goes, well, do you know any do you know any good guitar players? And I go, well. You know, what do you not mean? Too shabby I, myself I, here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can play guitar. And he goes, wait, what? And I go, I can play guitar, dude. Like I played all through Motley and Union and everything. So Warren called me, asked me to come down. I went to his house and he basically asked me to learn the harmony solo on round and round. Nice. So I said, okay. I learned the harmony solo. I went to Warren's house. I walked into his backyard with my guitar. We sat face to face. We pulled the guitars out. We played the solo. And he goes, okay, you're the guy. Wow. Simple as that, eh? Yeah, I was like, okay. Um, and it was more about um, Warren liked the fact that I could play uh, rhythm guitar. I could play some leads. But he was looking at it that the backing vocals would be that much stronger. Mm, right. So I was like, all right. And to be honest with you, at that point, I had already done the scream. Mm. I did the Motley thing. I did the Union thing. And I just kind of wanted a break where, like, especially Scream and Union. I was like a founding member of the band, mm -hmm. but even, even to a degree with Motley, you're always sitting there every day talking to the manager going, how many tickets did we sell today? How many t-shirts did we sell today? How many that, you know, da, da, da. there was all this business stuff involved. And with rat, it gave me the opportunity to go out and play music and still tour the world and not give a shit about how many tickets were sold. I just showed up, I played, I had a Guinness on the side of the stage and a whiskey <laughs> and an ashtray. And I literally, played, I literally played my set. I sang my backing vocals. And on Friday, they put a check in my hand. And I just, so it was like, a, I don't know. It was a bit of a mental break playing in Rat. You know what I mean? So I did it for seven years, eight years. Um, wow. I enjoyed every minute of it. And, um, and then I said, all right, I want to be a singer again. I want to go out and do my own thing. And I started putting a solo band together or trying to anyway, man. No, that, I mean, that's in incredible though. Cause it, it's kind of sounds like what you're saying now with the dead daisies about not hitting that burnout point and still, you know, being very much active. So, I mean, it's incredible strategy. Yeah, it, it's, you know. Again, I, I don't. Somebody just asked me earlier if I ever look back at things, and I'm like, no. I literally, I'm a very much in the moment, whatever. And if I decide, like, you know what, I, I don't want to do this. I want to take some time off, whatever. Um, I'm just, I, I make decisions on how I feel right now. You know what That's I mean? It. I look, I don't look, you know, past the end of my nose, to be honest with you. I'm just <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm kind of feeling this right now. So this is, this is what I'm going to do. And that's just how I felt at that time. You know what I mean? Um, it was funny. I was just telling somebody when I was out with rat, um, we had a, 
I think it was 2003. Um, we had a year off. Um, I was going through a divorce. A little bit fed up with some people and, and friends that I had in L.A. And again, I'm a very like stuff comes in here and I just react. Yeah. And I wanted to get out of town for a minute. I wanted to do something different. So I literally tried to get a, you know, anonymously. I tried to get a job working on a freight train. And just, I figured, well, I can just hang in the caboose and ride <laughs> across America. I'll take a guitar and a bag of clothing. And I can cross that off my bucket list. That's something I've always wanted to do was ride on a freight train from coast to coast. Well, then I realized you got to go to school for a gazillion years to learn how to drive a train. Yeah. So then I went, all right, well, what's something else I'm fascinated with? Trucks. Okay. So I literally put myself through school. And I got a driver's license. That's insane. And you went and did it. And yeah, I literally took a guitar and a satchel full of clothes. I threw them in the back of a truck. And I literally drove around America for like seven months. And then Warren called and said, hey, we're going on tour with Poison. And I was like, all right. I took the truck back to the company. I handed the guy the keys. And I said, I'm going on tour. Thanks for everything. Wow. And he would, he didn't, he had no idea. <laughs> and I said, He's like, oh, what tour? Yeah. yeah, I'm John Karabi. I used to sing with Motley Crue and, and I play guitar with the band Rat and I'm going on tour. So thanks for letting me use your truck for six months. <laughs> See ya. He must've been floored when he heard that. He, he was, <laughs> you know, but it's weird. Like I'm just, again, I'm, I kind of, I sit there and I see things or I'll feel something in a moment. And like a lot of people have asked me why I left the daisies, mm -hmm. you know, the, the band was picking up so much steam and we were busier than shit. And, but I just, I just felt something at that moment, a, a little bit burned out. I had just gotten married prior to joining the band. Yeah. So I felt like I said to my wife, uh, you know, with this ring, I be wed, I do. Oh, see you in four see ya. years. <laughs> yeah. And I left. And I was like, you know, and then I had a solo band as well with my son. And he was in my ear like, Dad, like we were doing, we were kicking ass. You're doing all this stuff. And you joined this band. And now I never see you or talk to you. Oh, man. So I just went, eh, you know what? Yeah, I, I, I got a hair and I went, I went to date I, David Lowy and I said, Hey dude, I really appreciate the offer, everything, but, um, I, I kind of want to step off this thing for a minute. Hmm. I'm going to put my solo band together and, um, I'm going to spend some time with my wife. And it was like, so okay, fair, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm just a very in the moment, whatever, whatever thought comes in this you know, I wouldn't even want to look inside my own head. I don't know what's going on. It. I just, just go, man. What, you got to stay moving. That's it. Well, it's just stay moving. And, you know, straight lines are boring, dude. Exactly. Yes. So that's they so that, are, man. That's so, my speech. Straight lines are boring. I, I honestly love this, man. To wrap it up, I, I want to know, just having spoken with you for the last, you know, half hour, obviously a man who has such a free spirit and we've heard that through your music for the you know past few decades with all the distractions in the world with all the noise how do you remain that free spirit and stay true to yourself just live dude we only go around once yeah uh you know my my motto is i get up in the morning i'm grateful i'm breathing <laughs> that's the mm -hmm. first thing and then i try to get through the day and i go to bed at night and I hope uh, I do my best to anything, like even if I would 
unintentionally screw somebody over, I'm genuinely sorry for it. I just get through life without intentionally screwing anybody over, live the best life you can. And you know what, if, if, you know, without doing anything detrimental to yourself, live your life to the fullest and enjoy everything. And if you've got bucket list shit that you want to do, just do it. You know yeah. what I mean? That's it. That's, that's what I try to live by. I try to do, um, whatever. I mean, e e <laughs> it's funny. Even my hairstyles, everybody's like, well, I, I remember you had short hair and then I saw you <laughs> with dreadlocks and then I see you with regular hair and then you have a beard and then no beard. And I'm like, <laughs> cause I just do what I feel like doing. In Felt that. Like it. Yeah. Fuck it. It's just live life, dude. That's incredible, Straight man. Straight lines are boring. That's the motto for this episode, everybody. So make sure to take note. John Karavi, thank you so much for your time, man. This has been incredible. Thank you, brother. 